It's the first Sunday of November. We're going to start a new sermon series this morning, looking at the holiness of God and how we are to respond to it. And then after the holiness of God has been revealed to us, where do we go from there? Three Sundays we'll be looking at God's holiness. We'll be looking at one passage of Scripture for the next three Sundays. I want to read the entirety of that passage for you, but this morning we'll be looking at the first three verses. And then next Sunday we'll look more of how we are to respond to what we see in this passage. We are in Isaiah chapter 6. The, uh, the, first, the first time that I spoke in front of the fellowship body before the church that is Fellowship Baptist Church, I gave a, it was like a 59-minute short devotional. And it was from Isaiah chapter 6. And I have been eagerly wanting to go back to Isaiah 6 ever since. Because I have gleaned from it new insights, and God has given to me new wisdom through, through His Word that He does. And I look at it so differently now than I did four years ago. This morning, we're in Isaiah 6. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. So if you have your Bible there, we have Bibles in the back of the pew that you may follow along as I read God's holy word this morning. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken from the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. We're going to stop there this morning. We will look at uh, verse 8 later on. But this morning we're going to focus in on just verses 1 through 3. And next week we'll move on into the next few verses, but this morning we will stop there. And I'm going to answer their question just real quick. Who is Isaiah? Well, Isaiah is a prophet. He's considered to be a major prophet. There are major and minor prophets. And for Isaiah, being considered a major prophet, it is that he wrote extensively. And there is a lot of writing that we have on Isaiah, and that's how they based it. Whether it's a major or a minor prophet, didn't matter uh, any sort of prominence or anything like that. It, they all spoke of, of essentially the same thing, of God speaking to them in order for God to give the word. Uh, they were used as a, as a mouthpiece for God, that God would give blessing or God would give curses uh, to his people or to, to other nations, and he would speak through the prophets and the writings that we have in the Old Testament of the prophets, there are some that wrote a lot. So there are larger books and there are some that wrote only a little. And so there are smaller books. And so the smaller ones are known as the minor prophets. Isaiah wrote a lot. And so Isaiah is considered a major prophet. Now, this office of being a prophet was, was not, I would say, an envied position. Now, it's not something that you can go on Indeed.com, especially not back then, they didn't have that, but still, you couldn't go on Indeed.com, uh, dust off your resume, put it out there that you want to be a prophet for God. That's not how it worked. It wasn't, it wasn't the case of you seeking after that job or that office, but instead God sought after those that would be called prophets. He went to them and he pulled them out of the world saying, you are going to be mine. You are going to be an instrument of mine. You're going to be a mouthpiece of mine that I am going to speak through you and you will give my words to my people. It was a lowly position. Many of the prophets were of a lowly estate. They were humble beginnings. Isaiah, on the other hand, was part of nobility. 
Uh, he, he is one, uh, he, he's one that is like the, I guess the cream of the crop. Uh, one of the prophets that, that had, I don't want to use the word privilege, but he, he was of the life of nobility. And the others, we see that they, they didn't come from anything. They came, they came from nothing. You can look back and you can see uh, one of the earliest prophets that we have. And he wrote a lot. At least we know that he wrote the first five books of the Bible. And that's Moses. Moses who really came from, from nothing. And God used the man who came from nothing in order to be something. It was through the work of God. Still, it it wasn't a glorious job because the work of the prophet was to give blessing. Now, many people enjoy blessings or words of blessing. Now, Jesus spoke about that being prophet, priest, and king. Jesus spoke about blessed are those, blessed art thou, blessed, blessed, blessed. And we read about the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. But there were also plenty of times when he would speak on the other side of that coin and he would give woe. And we have oftentimes where we hear there's, there's certain sections of Scripture when Jesus will say, woe to this generation or woe to the Pharisees. Woe to you. And a lot of people didn't like that. Many people want to hear, oh, give us the blessings. Give all of us the blessings. But then the prophet comes and the prophet's got what, what, what might seem to be a negative word from God. They don't want to hear that. And a prophet was often despised. And Jesus Christ knew it himself when he said that a prophet has no honor in his own home or his own town, his own city. Whenever he would go through Galilee and through Nazareth, he was rejected. He was despised. They, they knew of his humble upbringing as well, but also they did not want to hear often. They did not want to hear the woes that came from God. They would only want to hear the blessings. But as a prophet, you give the word that is given to you to give to the people. I hope that made sense. In my mind, it made sense. Being a prophet was not glamorous. It was extremely difficult. There were many, I look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah didn't want to be a prophet. There were any, many times too when he said, I don't want to do this anymore. And then God would encourage him and say, look, Jeremiah, look, I knew you before you were in the womb and you're going to do this. It was a tough thing to do. And here in this moment, Isaiah, we find as many of the other prophets, they would serve underneath kings. Nathan was a prophet who served underneath King David. Samuel was a prophet who served underneath Saul, the first king of Israel. Isaiah, we find now, as we have a date that is given to us, served under the kingship of Uzziah. We find in this very first verse, chapter 6, that Uzziah has died. So within the year of the king's death, Isaiah was given an image of God. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So when setting this scene, this this encounter that Isaiah is having with the Lord, I read through a commentary after I had written what I wanted to say. I will often go to commentaries to kind of see if anything matches up or if anything I said was, um, was errant in any way. I went to a commentary and it completely changed the way that I saw this because in my mind, whenever I read Isaiah chapter six, I think of Isaiah just being anywhere, right? Just being anywhere. And then suddenly poof, there's an image of, of the throne room of God and he's looking up into heaven. But then I read a commentary that suggested that Isaiah would have been in a time of mourning for an entire year would have been in a time of mourning, mourning over the death of their king. And it's likely that he would have been in the earthly temple at this moment and had an expectation of going into the temple in, in, in mourning and in grieving, not in the morning, but in mourning, in grieving, uh, in order to do whatever duty it was for him as a prophet at that time and that day, whatever feast it was or whatever, whatever day of the year it was that he needed to be in there, or if it was a time that he was in there seeking solace or comfort uh, for his, his grieving. And an expectation of walking into the temple that day, but then he is suddenly greeted by the throne room of God. That's incredible. Like I completely changed the way I look at this. If it's a possibility that God has brought, brought himself to earth in a certain form, that he is seated on a throne and it is in an earthly temple. But then again, I, I'm reminded of how the temple was set up in the first place. That there was a throne set up for God. If you go beyond the veil that is there and into the Holy of Holies, then you are there where the Ark of the Covenant is that's known as the mercy seat. And it's upon the mercy seat where God is seated amongst his people. But this is different. 
Isaiah is seeing something different, something that he probably wasn't expecting to see that day. He's given a glimpse that only a few people have been able to glimpse. He's given a glimpse of a throne room, and there is the Lord seated on a throne high and lifted up. And there are these heavenly creatures that are surrounding him. And then I think I try to put myself in the shoes of Isaiah the best I can in his mourning and in his grieving, realizing that the leadership of his people, the leader of his people is dead. But then in that image, the image that is given to us must invoke a thought in our minds. I'm going to say that a lot this morning. It must invoke a thought in our minds when we realize the estate of Israel at that time. That their king has died. And the prophet of the king is awaiting the coronation or the anointing of another king of the next king. But then he is given an image of the eternal king. And in the midst of death, And in grieving, he is reminded, as we are reminded today, that God sits on a throne for eternity. Constantly reigning. Eternally reigning. His reign will never end. It will never cease. So we are reminded of that this morning. Of all the things that are going on in this world, we are reminded that God is still seated on His throne. And will remain there sovereign over everything forever. Isaiah uses the word Lord here. And it's important that we understand how it is written here. It's capital L for Lord because it's a proper noun. But then you'll find that the O-R-D is in lowercase. Well, pastor, that just makes sense, right? Well, there's a thing thing about this original original language that it's, it's written in. So there's this thing about Hebrew that they had a... They had a lot of names for God. Uh, They had a lot of different ways of writing his name. And in order to translate it over into English, they had to figure out different ways of of showing emphasis for the reader to understand what name is being used for God. This is extremely important when we're talking about a king who has died. He refers to God as Adonai. He's referring to God in 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 a word that is translated as Lord to us. But it's Adonai, which means Sovereign One. And so in, in, our, in our text that we have, when you see the capital L with lowercase o-r-d, know that it means Adonai, that it means Sovereign One. So Uzziah is never not sovereign anymore. He's not king anymore because guess what? He's dead. But then he sees the Lord seated on an eternal throne. The Adonai, the Sovereign One. It is a title that's given to God. And so then we'll also find Lord used later where there's a capital L and then there's like smaller, all caps, O-R-D. And that doesn't mean Adonai. It's different now. It's still for us Lord. But in the Hebrew language, that's the unspeakable word for God. That's the name for God that God gave to himself when he appeared to Moses. And Moses said, what's your name? You got to give me a name. I am. I am is what God said to Moses. I am, which is translated, it's the, it's, the, it's the word Yahweh, but even still they translate it as Yahweh in fear of taking that name in vain. There is a lot of fear wrapped around that name because there should be. It is a name to be honored. It is a name to be awe-inspiring. It is a name that should be used in reverence. Only when we speak of God as the I am, that he is the self-sustaining one. No one has a name like it. So they're very careful in how they use that name. But here, Isaiah referring to God as Adonai, as the sovereign one, we are reminded of his throne. And the Lord is not alone in the temple. The image that we have shown for us as the sovereign one seated on an eternal throne, high and lifted up, that the train of his robe fills the temple. How glorious of a thought that is. More beautiful than any bride's train when she would come down the aisle on her wedding day. His train is filling up the temple. So we have this heavenly image of one seated, but he is not alone. And with him, we have what we like to call as human beings, we like to call them angels. 
In verse 2, above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. What a fascinating image. I, I've never seen anything like that. The only, I want to say the only creature that I have seen that has multiple wings is a dragonfly. They have two sets of wings. I don't know of any other creature, I don't know of any birds that have multiple wings, unless it's like a mutation, then that's just not right. Uh, the only, the only it's, like, it's an insect. Uh, there, are, there might be other insects that have more than two wings that I'm not sure about, but the first one that comes to mind is, is a dragonfly. I've never seen anything like that. Have you? I don't think so. And Isaiah here is doing the best that he can to, to speak in his own language this heavenly image of what he is seeing. Uh, now, th- this is, and let me, let me explain to you why this is so difficult. It's because the foundation of the temple wasn't the only thing that was shook that day. Isaiah was shook also. And it's overwhelming. This scene that is seen here is extremely overwhelming for a human being. For us to look into the throne room of God, we would fall on our knees. That's how overwhelming it would be. We would be the ones saying, woe is me. I am undone. Much like Isaiah here. He shook. If that's the proper way of saying that in the South, I believe it is. He shook. All shook up. Uh Why did I do that? But our simple minds, we have a hard time grasping on to such a heavenly sight. And Isaiah is doing the best he can as he's overwhelmed in this moment. And he's seeing these heavenly creatures as they stand above the throne of God. They have six wings. That's just incredible. With two of them covering their face. With two of them, they're covering their feet. And with two of them, they are flying. And here's what it does is it invokes something within me. And it should for you as well as you read these words. The idea of of, uh, what happens. Let me ask you this. What happens when we have angelic beings coming down from earth and we have scripture uh, that tells us of these moments when those angelic beings appear to human beings, what is normally said by, by the uh, angelic creature in that moment? Fear not, right? Because it's an overwhelming and fearful thing to, to behold. And so we have, we can read the, the Christmas story of, of, of Mary and she's seeing a vision of, of Gabriel. And one of the first things that Gabriel would say is, you are favored, right? You're favored. Fear not. For those that, that fall and are trembling before the angelic being and many of them fall and begin to worship and the angels are like, no, I'm just a servant like you are. Don't worship me. Worship God. That's what the angel says to John in Revelation. These are created beings that God created for a purpose. And I believe in this vision, they are meant to invoke something with us. And so when I, when I see the idea that I have that idea in my head of, of something being in the presence of God and having to cover their face, I'm quickly reminded of the glory of God. I'm reminded of the glory of God and that it is too much to behold. I mean, even for humans, it's too much to behold. I mean, we look at Moses, good grief, Moses Man, he was shown so much. He's, we saw, he saw the Nile turned into blood. He saw the Red Sea parted. He saw the Red Sea come down and destroy uh, Pharaoh and all of Pharaoh's armies. He saw these amazing things that were happening, a burning bush and all these wonderful things. He followed a, a pillar of fire at night and a cloud of smoke in the morning. I imagine what the, what the Israelites were like at that time. He's like, one Israelite looking at the other like, where are we going? What are we doing? I don't know. Just follow the fire tornado and we'll be okay. Like it, it was some strange times and it was some sights to behold. But Moses, even still, Moses is like, that's not enough. The dude was stubborn. That's not enough. God, I want to see your glory. Well, Moses, you've already seen all these things. All these miraculous and unbelievable things. And now he has, in his own stubbornness, the audacity to say to God, I, I want to see your glory. I got to see it. So God's like, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you what you want, but only in part. So they went up onto the mountain. Moses went up onto the mountain where he often met with God. 
And God said to him, look, and this is Exodus, uh, Exodus 33 is where you find this encounter of Moses and God. God's like, if you look upon my glory, you will die. And scripture tells us that humans cannot handle the glory of God. Fallen creatures cannot handle the glory of God. And so Moses, in, or God in his mercy towards Moses said, you see this, this crevice here, or for those who shop at Tarjay, you see this crevasse over here? I need you to turn your back and go into this crevice. With your back turned, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move past you. And I will let you know when it's time to look. So Moses, hiding back in this crevice in the mountain, God comes by, turns his back to Moses, saying, now's now's the time you can look. Moses looks at the back of God, not God's face, but looks at the back of God and sees in part the glory of God. And then what happens? When Moses goes down from that mountain, everyone was terrified. Because Moses was glowing. He had been in the holiness. He had been in the glory of God. And the face of Moses was glowing so much that the entire nation of Israel that was at the foot of that mountain was afraid to go near him. That they wouldn't go near him until he had a veil over his face. They were terrified. That's the glory of God. It invokes fear for those who are fallen. And Moses couldn't handle it. Imagine the Israelites, if they had been there in that moment and seen the full glory of God, every single one of them would have fallen down dead. If Moses had just decided to do this around God's back, to look at God's face, Moses would have fallen down dead. And even in that small bit of glory that Moses saw, it was too much for any human to handle. They were stricken with fear. So these angels are covering their face. And it speaks to me how glorious the presence of God is. And then they had to cover their feet. What, what's, all that, what's that about? They covered their feet. Well, once again, it leads me to the holiness of God. Once again, I, it invokes a thought in me of Moses. What is it about Moses? Oh, Moses. There's a, there's a bush right there, and it's on fire. Moses, he hears, he's up on that mountain, right? And he, there's this burning bush, and it's not, it's not burning away but it's on fire. And here's the voice of God. And God says to Moses, take off your shoes. Why? Because the ground that you walk on, Moses, is holy. What made it holy? God was there. The presence of God in that burning bush made everything around it Holy. So there's this idea then, as many commentators and scholars say, that in that moment, being a a human creature of the earth, having feet of clay is what Scripture says. Having feet of clay, he had to take his shoes off in order to walk on holy ground. But then we have the image of these angels that are having to cover their feet. They're created beings as well as human beings. Our feet are tethered to the ground that is the earth as angelic beings, their feet may not be tethered to the, to the earthly ground, but in, in, in any case, as created beings, they were likely instructed that they had no other choice, but they had to keep their feet covered because of the holiness of God. They had to keep their faces covered because of the glory of God. These are just the images, the ideas that are brought to my mind when we look at this verse. We move on as the emphasis of God's holiness is very clear. And we find it in the next verse where the angelic beings, these creatures, these seraphim begin to speak, one calling to the other. 
In verse 3, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now in English, we have uh, techniques in writing that help us understand when an author or writer is wanting to show emphasis on something. Uh, It might be italicized. It might be in bold typeface. uh, It might be underlined. Uh, It it could be uh, in all caps, like in a text message or something. You get all caps from somebody, and you're like, why are they yelling at me? Or they're putting putting emphasis on one word, or they'll put an exclamation point at the end of the sentence to make sure that you understand that that there is emphasis that's put on this sentence or on this word. I put the emphasis on the wrong syllable there. In English, we have techniques for showing this. But in Hebrew, they didn't have that. Uh, Hebrew, it was written extremely simple. They didn't have vowels. They only had consonants. Made it difficult to translate. Uh, They didn't have punctuation either. Made it difficult to translate. Uh, Did you know when a sentence ended and another one began with a capitalization? Absolutely not. It's made it difficult to translate. So what they did in order to show emphasis is they would use repetition. They would repeat certain words to show that there was emphasis put on one word indicating it's important. Jesus used this. Also, Jesus did this. He would uh, sometimes begin extremely important uh, sentences with, truly, truly, I say to you, or verily, verily, I say to you. Surely, surely. I don't know who surely is, but Jesus really talked to her a lot in some translations of the Bible. And there's emphasis that is being put. You know when he says, truly, truly, I say to you, you better open your ears and listen because it's going to be important. An extreme emphasis is put on the next sentence that comes out of Jesus' mouth. So back in the Old Testament, you would find that there were words that were often repeated. So when you saw in, 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 in succession two words repeated, then it was very important, these words. And we find it, you know, often there are three words. There's, there's one word repeated three times. We find that too. Uh, one, of them, one of them that we find, I believe it's in Revelation, uh, when an angel is speaking of woes that are falling on the earth, it, the angel says, woe, 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 and then gives the bad news. Or another one where, I believe it's Jeremiah, is, is, is defending the worship in the temple, and he says three times the same phrase, it's the temple of the Lord. It's the temple of the Lord. It's the temple of the Lord. Now Jesus going in there with whips and he flipped over tables. Not, not like acrobatically, but like, like that. Flipped tables over. Rephrase that. There's only one instance though when we have a, a, a single word in a three-part repetition that gives an attribute of God. There's only one word that's used three times to speak of God. Holy, holy, holy. The word holy means set apart. Not like anything else. It means not like anything else. It is set apart. God is set apart. God is set apart. God is set. There is nothing like him. Nothing. Nothing. For he is holy, holy, holy. You know, the Bible doesn't say that God is love, love, love. I mean, it doesn't even say that he's just holy, like merely holy or just holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. And it doesn't say that God is grace, grace, grace. It doesn't say that God is wrath, wrath, wrath. The emphasis on the holiness of God needs to be seen. We must recognize, respect the awe-inspiring holiness, holiness, holiness of God. And that is what the author is trying his best. As the angels are there giving this emphasis in the holiness of God, well, they can't help it. They can't help but sing. And the reason why I say sing is because this is written out in a stanza form as if it is a song that is being sung. So the seraphim here recognize 
that God is to be praised, that God is to be worshipped. And if you're stubborn like old Moses and you want to see the glory of God, look at what the angels say. Three times God is holy, and once he, they say, the earth is filled with what? His glory. You want to see God's glory today? And this, is, this is a very dangerous question because the glory of God is hard to look upon. You want to see the glory of God today? Look around. And consider every single life that is in this room right now. You want to see the glory of God? Step outside of these doors and look at the trees. Hear the birds singing. Look at the clouds in the sky. The grass in the field as the wind blows through it and you see it dancing for our Lord. You look outside and you see all of creation and you see the glory of God. You want to see the glory of God today? Look in the mirror. And then you look in the mirror and you will see a creature that is created in the image of God. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made. You want to see the glory of God today? Open the Bible. And you will have it right there in black and white, some of it in red, if you've got the red letter Bible. All of it is the Word of God. All of it inspired, fully inspired by the Holy Spirit. We see the glory of God every time we gather together in this place because this is an image of something that we will take part in for eternity. We get up here and the, the team leads, leads the congregation in four songs every Sunday. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. But this, we were up here singing, and that drummer was killing it this morning, and, and it was good. It felt good. I mean, that's not what it's about. It's not about that feeling. What it's about is giving up yourself. And too often, we, we, we come together fumbling over ourselves instead of worshiping God. When what we have to do is we have to give up ourselves and a realization of the holiness of God that we gather together, it is an image of what heaven is like. That the creatures that are there cannot help but say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the temple shook. Which we'll get to that next week. And here's what I want for you as you leave this place this morning to be reminded that no matter what this world throws at you, whether you're having a good day or a bad day, whether you're climbing mountains or strolling through valleys, be reminded today of who remains seated on an eternal throne the Sovereign One, Adonai, God. He reigns forevermore. Be reminded too that when we gather together, we gather to be a representation of what we will be doing eternally. Through all eternity, what we will be doing. Now for some of us, this song that is in Isaiah might sound familiar. And I would hope that it is familiar for those who have read through John's Revelation. And in Revelation 4, verse 8, is where we see that same one word repeated three times as the angels that are surrounding the throne of God say, holy, holy, holy. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and one was covering eye, well, eyes all over, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I want to speak to believers in this room this morning or any of those that are listening online. There will be a day when you, those who have received Jesus Christ, will gather in His throne room. We will gather in His throne room. And on that day, we will gather with the angels. We will gather with the saints. All of us join together in one voice to worship God for all eternity. 
And here's what's important. It begins today. The worship that you bring into this place must be a representation of the worship of that day. One day when we will be in the throne room. Day and night, it will never stop. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And here in this place, for just a moment, I want you to forget about the atrocities that are happening in this world. In this moment, think of heaven. In this moment, think of that scene that we see here in Isaiah, that Isaiah saw, or that scene that John saw. Think of God Almighty in this moment, seated on a throne of mercy and grace. In this moment, look into heaven. Just as Stephen did before he died. And did proclaim, I see the Lord. If only just for a moment, look into heaven. Here in this place. And may it invoke a thought in your mind of Jesus Christ. Seated at the right hand of the Father. That is what we must do every time we come together. We must be reminded of the majesty, the glory, and the holiness, the holiness, the holiness of Jesus Christ. Because there will be a day, church, when we will be there. That in this moment, surrender everything that you are to Him. Surrender your heart, your praise, your worship, your love. Surrender your life to the only one who is holy, holy, holy. And in so doing, He will lead you down a path to make you holy. Because here's what is instructed for us. I want to talk to the unbelievers in the room or those that might be listening online. The author of Hebrews in his writing is is pretty stern in what is said in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. This is a calling that is given to all Christians that we must strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness, the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So we strive for a holiness, that which looks like Jesus Christ, the holiness of Him. That is what we strive for every single day. And if you want to see the Lord, you must strive for the holiness that is found and only given to us through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm wrestling with a thought, but I'm just going to... Everybody got an hour of sleep last night extra, so just bear with me. That means I get another hour, right, Tim? I get another hour to preach. I read an article yesterday that was extremely upsetting. But man, it... Hold, there's a truth in these words of Scripture that... I'll just tell you, there is a pastor in Georgia who was living a double life who was going online uh, pretending to be a a transgender woman, uh, posting extremely inappropriate things about himself. When he was interviewed after finding out what happened, and, and he was also the mayor of a city in Georgia, he was interviewed by a news group saying, how can you do these things? How can you do these things and be a mayor and be a pastor? And here's what he, here's what he said uh, in the interview. He said, my private life is separate than my holy life. Hmm. 
when he was found out and the things that he was doing were federal offenses, he was chased down by the cops and he took his own life in front of them. Because here's the truth. As Christians, your holy life is your only life. There is no separation of a private life and a holy life. The life that you live outside these four walls must be a representation of the life you live inside these four walls. There should be no separation. It's appalling. And a church now needs a leader. And I pray for that church. I pray for that city that they would find someone who understands that there's no separation between a private life and a holy life. You don't live a double life. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me.